Hello, everyone who is joining us on Facebook and coming in on Zoom. We will be getting started with the annual meeting in just about one minute. So thank you all for coming. All right, looks like we're at 1030. Taylor, should we go ahead and get started? That sounds great. All right. Welcome, everyone, to our annual meeting webinar. Uh, we It's really been fabulous to be able to do these as, as webinars. We get to reach so many more people. So uh, I'm Liz Perry, Crow Canyon's president, and I will be your moderator today. And with me is our chief financial officer, Carla Hain. Hi, everyone. Excellent. All right. Well, let's just jump right in because we have a lot uh, to show you today. We always begin with our land acknowledgement. The Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickorya Apache people on whose traditional homelands our institution sits. Our mission-related work is not possible without indigenous people in the past, present, and future, and we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all of humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people, and we support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Thank you to all of our indigenous partners. Uh, I know everybody's pretty familiar with Zoom. Uh, I do this most every week on the webinars, but uh, especially today, if you have questions during the presentation, please pop them into the Q&A. Uh, Carla will be keeping an eye on it, and if there's some easy questions, she will... Uh, not easy, Carla can answer hard questions, but uh, she'll address anything uh, that can be addressed simply, uh, and we will get to as many questions as we can uh, at the end of the meeting. If you're on Zoom and it's given you trouble, we are live streaming on Facebook, and the annual meeting, as is last year's and the year before, are up on our YouTube channel. So if you miss any parts of it, you can go back and see it. So this is it, 40 years. We, um, it's kind of hard to believe that it's here. We've actually been looking forward to this anniversary uh, since I began as president in 2018, really had our eye on this and what we wanted to uh, accomplish uh, at this time. And, and we were already thinking about our 40th anniversary volume, which has been published and uh, the conference that we're having week after next. So uh, it is absolutely true. Thank you, thank you everyone who's watching for your support of our mission. Uh, we, we literally would not be here 40 years later uh, without all of you who have been with us so long and with all of you who have, have only joined us recently. We are incredibly grateful to have reached this milestone and we will be talking about what we'll be doing as we get to 50. So this is the meeting agenda for today. Uh, this is me calling the meeting to order. Uh, our, our chairman, Ricky Lightfoot, uh, who is uh, retiring as chairman, but staying on the board, uh, is on the Colorado River with his family right now, uh, a, a conflict that could not be remedied. So uh, we did a, our incredible staff made a wonderful uh, video of Ricky uh, talking about uh, his, the last 40 years, his involvement with Crow Canyon uh, and where we're headed for the future. We are incredibly grateful to Ricky for his service for the last 38 years, which he will talk about, and for his uh, last six years of service as our chair of the board. Uh, he will continue to serve uh, once he steps down as chair, as the chair of the executive committee uh, and the investment committee, uh, which is really his passion, uh, leading the safeguarding of Crow Canyon's assets and investments to help ensure our sustainable future. So uh, Taylor, would you like to go ahead and we will uh, show our video of Ricky. Hi, I'm Ricky Lightfoot. It's 
2023 and Crow Canyon is celebrating 40 years as a research and education institution and I'm happy to be celebrating 39 years of participation starting as a seasonal archaeo educator uh, and growing eventually into being the president and CEO and then for the last 13 years a, a board member and, and now chair of the board. When I was president and CEO from 1998 to 2010 um, I tried to articulate a vision for the, the future direction. Someone once told me that if you don't know where you're going, almost any, any road will lead you there. So I wanted to create a vision for Crow Canyon to help us to focus on the, the activities and things that we should be doing and, and help sort those out from the ones that we should not be doing. I uh, wrote a, a pamphlet, a small booklet that described that the goal for Crow Canyon was to expand the sphere in which we operate both geographically and intellectually and show how the knowledge gained through archaeology can help build a better society. I look at things like the establishment of the Research Institute, establishing partnerships and working relationships with scholars from uh, many different fields all across the country and realizing that the way Crow Canyon was going to be successful in accomplishing its large projects was to collaborate with far more people than we could ever hire. One of the other things that happened along the way was expanding our involvement with American Indians. Uh, Sandy Thompson was one of the early presidents of Crow Canyon and he really instructed us that how can we be studying the history of American Indian people who are living today right here in our backyard or the descendants are living here and not engage them in the conversation. So we began to host meetings that involved American Indians to incorporate them in the planning of our research so we were not only asking them to give our, their perspectives on what we were studying and what we were learning but also to incorporate questions that they had which made our work more relevant in their world. Our participation with American Indians as, as scholars, as staff members and board members uh, continues to grow. In terms of expanding geographically, when I started out we were looking at single sites. I started working on the Duckfoot site in 1984. We then expanded that to uh, work on the Sand Canyon site. Uh, Bill Light became the research director and expanded that into a locality study which eventually we grew into studying the large village sites through all, throughout all of southwest Colorado and eventually expanded that to be an interregional study of looking at the migration from the Mesa Verde region to uh, areas where Pueblo Indians live today, uh, primarily looking at the relationship between the Mesa Verde region and the Tewa Pueblos of uh, the Rio Grande Valley. As we expanded geographically, also taking on those larger and larger social questions about the relationships between people in households and in communities and in regions and between regions was an important uh, intellectual expansion. And also to uh, look at that migration where we're not only looking at the uh, exodus from southwestern Colorado, but looking at the history of people who live, the living Pueblo Indians today who were um, whose ancestors were a part of that migration. So these, the studies became much more relevant to them and they had much more to offer. It was an interesting divide because archaeologists in southwest Colorado could see populations, large populations, up until just before AD 1300. And on the other end of the spectrum, on the, on the receiving end, Pueblo Indian people could tell you about their history of where their villages were and where they where they were and where they moved after about 1300 but they had stories that went much deeper but they couldn't show you sites because they they didn't know where they were so connecting the dots of to bring Pueblo people to the Four Corners and to the southwest Colorado area and start to basically let them see their homeland before 1300 We've also, uh, since before 2020, began to expand our online content. And so the, the, the idea of having a, a broader reach and expanding a, the sphere in which we operate was also to be able to reach more people. And there was always going to be a limit to how many people who could pay for travel and pay to come to our campus and participate in programs. So through the webinar series and through other online programming, we've greatly expanded the number of people who are staying in touch with us and connected with us.
Two phrases that have shaped uh, the thoughts of the staff throughout the time here at Crow Canyon that I would say it's just became part of the, the DNA of staff members was that uh, the saying that uh, it's not what you find, it's what you find out. Archaeology for us was never about finding objects or you know the, the physical things other than the fact that they were a part of helping us to tell the story. So the, uh, the gaining of knowledge was far more important than the collecting of things. And I think that still uh, holds true for us today, is that as we move into, into areas of research that don't involve excavation, that involves synthesizing 40 years of research of our work and of other collaborators around the country and throughout the region, then our knowledge is expanding at a, at a scale where we're not just you know, trying to find out that they ate corn, beans, and squash, and not just finding out that the Indians on one side of the river knew that there were Indians on the other side of the river, but really exploring those relationships between social groups and across time and space. The other idea that permeated the culture of the staff at Crow Canyon was that everyone's history matters. Largely, we wanted to um, focus on those indigenous societies uh, which have been left out of the story of America's history and yet have a 10,000 year role in, uh, in shaping what that history looks like. And today, they're not disappearing peoples, indigenous peoples being studied by Europeans, but more and more they're colleagues that have PhDs and colleagues that have knowledge that we as archaeologists don't have, knowledge of their own traditional cultures. And so trying to incorporate that knowledge with scientific knowledge is an important part of the collaboration that we're trying to build. So we really need to look forward and think about what is it that we have to contribute. And I think that's always been a, a, an important part of the way Crook Canyon operated, is to have a vision of the long-term view of where we're headed, but also be kind of nimble and able to adjust and take on new projects and, and focus on studies that we might not have anticipated uh, when, we, when we set out in that longer-term view. So I think the, the, the metaphor I like is that the vision uh, ch pointed out which mountain we were headed toward, but it didn't show the path to get there. The path had to be figured out, but the, having the, the direction, the, the metaphorical mountain to, to be our destination gave us clarity in deciding which fork in the trail to take. So Crow Canyon is celebrating its 40 years of success in education, research, and relation partnerships with American Indians. But what we did in the past is not a roadmap for where we go in the future. And developing, continuing to expand on truly equitable relationships with our American Indian partners, continuing to expand the number of partners that we're engaged with, and continuing to broaden the scope of our look at their history and how we can work together to better understand that and build a, a healthier society. I'm proud to have been a part of that past and I look forward to the next 40 years for Crook Canyon. Thank you. That was that was just wonderful. Um, am I still on? I'm having a little trouble seeing myself. Yep, you're still on. Okay, great. Excellent. Um, is my video on? Yes, ma'am. Oh, excellent. Sorry. Uh, a few, a few Zoom uh, challenges for me as well. Um, we have we we have been and we still are so incredibly lucky to have Ricky as a mentor, a guide, uh, someone who's also always doing a heavy lift for Crow Canyon in fundraising and other types of board management. So I'm very sorry that he couldn't be here today, but uh, we're incredibly grateful to have that wonderful video summary from him. There are two other board members that I would like to honor uh, this year. Uh, one is, we have one of our members who is retiring from the board uh, at this at this meeting at our at our annual meeting this year, Roberta Rubin. Uh, she 
uh, is quite beloved by all of us. She's retiring from active service on the board after 21 years as a trustee and 35 years of participation in our programs and incredibly generous support as a donor. Uh, Roberta lives in Evanston, Illinois, where she was an independent bookseller for over 40 years and her passion for reading and writing and research and her entrepreneurial spirit have made huge contributions uh, to our success since she joined the Crow Canyon family. So thank you, Roberta. Uh, the next board member that I'd like to honor is Ron Larimore. Uh, he's a former chair of Crow Canyon, and he passed away this year while he was serving as chair of the executive committee. Ron was a significant mentor to me and to others at Crow Canyon, and his passing uh, this summer has affected all of us very much. So we have a short video uh, to play to share some pictures of Ron. Our board member Ron Larimore died in May this year. I'd seen him the week before in his studio in Taos. He said he wasn't feeling up to coming to our board meeting in June. And I asked him if he was up for visitors and he said, absolutely come to the studio. Ron loved visiting with people in his studio and I loved asking him questions about all the paintings and he loved answering them. So we were a very good fit that way. Ron loved being a mentor. When I started, he sent me his favorite book on nonprofit management and a really nice letter. And he was my first call when things got really hard. The lesson that I carry with me in my heart from Ron is how to love life. Ron loved life. Cancer couldn't touch it, hardship, losing people, suffering. These are all the more reasons to love life. I sure miss you, Ron but I see you in the sky above, in the tall grass, in the ones I love. That has been a, it's been a, that was a very tough loss uh, for all of us, but Ron is, uh, still with all of us and we still use uh, many of, of Ron's uh, Ron-isms in all of our meetings. Uh, the number one being there's no penalty for ending a meeting early. He was very into efficiency. I don't think that we'll end up ending this one early. But um, Next, uh, we move into our mission updates. So uh, our incredible staff, we knew that uh, everyone would be very busy uh, this week and this weekend because we're preparing for our 40th anniversary conference. Uh, so a few months ago, we decided, well, let's let's go ahead and make some, make some videos, decide what we wanna share with our supporters at the annual meeting uh, so that uh, we, don't, we don't have everyone kind of running, uh, running amok uh, this week. So we have uh, two of our staff members who are amazing videographers, Laura Brown uh, and Jeremy Grinvig, and they have been working for months with our staff uh, to compile these uh, video department updates for you. We, we hope you'll enjoy them. First up is an update from our cultural explorations and outreach department that is led by your friend and mine, Sarah Payne. So I think we'll go ahead and start the videos. Hi, Sarah Payne here. I'm the Chief Outreach Officer at Crow Canyon. We strive to keep people connected by offering a variety of outreach opportunities that engage a broad community of learners, from online webinars to campus-based workshops, to in-person travel seminars and backcountry adventures. Cultural Explorations works with colleagues and community members to offer exceptional transformative opportunities that foster cultural understanding and respect. Specializing in small group sizes and a limited number of programs each year, program managers collaborate with staff, tribal members, cultural specialists, and subject matter experts to customize an experience that connects people to inclusive and accurate knowledge. This year, we hosted four unique travel seminars and workshops. Hiking the Bears Ears took place in March, led by Lyle Belanqua, an archaeologist from the Hopi village of Bakavi, and Crow Canyon's field archaeologist, Steve Copeland. 
we applied scholarship funds to support additional cultural advisors on the program. Richie Sania, Atri Loma Ongva, and Nate Francis are individuals who participated in this new initiative, and it was very successful in diversifying perspectives, enhancing educational impact, connecting people to ancestral landscapes, and providing opportunities for career development and mentorship. We were also able to work with our partners to collect footage from these programs and turn it into an Indigenous Guide webinar. So be sure to tune in to our Discover Archaeology webinar series on Thursday, November 16th at 4 o'clock Mountain Standard Time to view it live. The Chaco to Mesa Verde Travel Seminar took place in April with Crow Canyon's former field director, Kellum Throgmorton, and Octavia Seatua, a cultural advisor, elder, and traditional medicine leader at Oshawi, Zuni Pueblo, and a founding member of Crow Canyon's Pueblo Advisory Group. While traversing the landscape of northern New Mexico and southwest Colorado, participants gained an appreciation for the ingenuity and resilience of past and present cultures and learned how different perspectives influence cutting edge research and education. The Pueblo Weaving Workshop took place in August and was inspired by the textile traditions and social identity research that Crow Canyon staff have been working on with Pueblo community members. Led by Chris Lewis from Zuni, Austin Kuchiamtua from Hopi, and Crow Canyon's former lab director, Ben Bellarado, students spent a week learning to spin yarn and weave a belt on a loom. We were honored to invite six indigenous students from the pueblos of Akuma, Hopi, Jemez, Kewa, Zuni, and Santa Clara, as well as welcome participants from Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Oregon, California, New York, and Florida. It was an inspiring opportunity to learn about Pueblo cultures, provide mentorship and knowledge in traditional skills, connect people to ancestral landscapes, make new friends, and build community. Earlier this month, we hosted a Uinta Fremont Pathways seminar featuring archaeologists Carol Patterson and Glade Haddon, as well as Crow Canyon's American Indian Initiatives Manager, Rebecca Hammond. Ten participants joined us from Maryland, New Mexico, California, Oregon, and Washington, D.C., in addition to Larry Sespooch from the Northern Ute Nation and several tribal members from the White Mountain Apache Nation. Together, we shared different perspectives about who the Uinta people were, who the descendant people are today, and how to identify cultural signatures in the archaeological record. Since our new website was launched in 2020, we've been working with engineers to migrate 40 years of educational resources and one of the largest archaeological research databases in the country to a more secure platform. These efforts will enhance accessibility to data sets for researchers and learning modules for educators and will continue to refine these materials in the years to come. In celebration of our 40th anniversary milestone, our outreach team focused its efforts on sharing memories from the Crow Canyon community and creating unique videos that inspire a reflection on 40 years, as well as inspiration for the next 40. As part of the weekly webinar series, the first Thursday of each month was reserved for speakers related to our milestone year, covering a range of topics highlighting the past, present, and future of Crow Canyon. The Discover Archaeology webinar series was launched in 2020 to keep Crow Canyon's community engaged at a distance. Guided by the principle that there are many ways of knowing the past, these events reflect diverse voices that contribute to our understanding of the past, present, and future. Webinars are complementary and led by renowned researchers, cultural specialists, tribal members, academics, and experts. This year, nearly half the webinars were presented by Indigenous scholars. Additionally, November will highlight exclusively Native American scholars in honor of Native American Heritage Month. Speakers have been brought in from different countries this year, including Canada, Poland, and the United Kingdom, demonstrating a broader reach of scholars who each contribute a unique perspective to Southwest archaeology. 
We are grateful to all of you for your ongoing support and commitment to Crow Canyon's mission. This work would not be possible without your generosity, encouragement, and inspiration. Thank you so much. Like Sarah talked about in the video, we have been so fortunate to have so many distinguished indigenous scholars uh, and archeologists uh, who worked with us this year. So I thought a good follow-up uh, to that, that summary uh, is to hear from the leader of our American Indian Initiatives Department, uh, employee of Crow Canyon for 28 years, founding member of our Native American Advisory Group, uh, and my dear friend. I think you can probably guess who it is, but you will see it in just a moment. Oh, hi! You caught us reading books from our new library. My name is Rebecca Renteria, and you all previously met me as the American Indian Initiatives intern, and I was fortunate enough to um, be kept on staff here, and I'm now serving as the American Indian Initiatives Outreach Coordinator um, with Becky. Remember the earth whose skin you are, red earth, black earth, yellow earth, White Earth, Brown Earth, we are Earth. Hi, my name is Becky, as most of you know, and we are excited. One of the projects that we're doing is our library. And if you take a look, we've gotten off to a really great start, but as you know, we could always use your help with more books. The books that we're interested in, and my dream is to have an all native library, native authors. And if you're interested in helping us out, uh, we have a Amazon web link, wish list. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Becky and Rebecca. And I think uh, Taylor can put in the chat their Amazon wish list uh, if you would like that, like to help them fill the shelves uh, in their Indigenous Author Library. Uh, as you know, uh, Becky is also a longtime educator at Crow Canyon. With with her spending more times on new initiatives and with the retirement of another longtime educator this year, Paul Ermagiotti, we have hired some incredible uh, new educators at Crow Canyon and they got together to make this update for you. They would like to introduce you to the Mobile Learning Lab that was generously funded uh, by our donors, all of you last year. Uh, and here we go, be warned, some of them were in their drama clubs in college. How you doing? Doing well, sir. How are you? Pretty good. Good. Welcome to the Mobile Learning Lab. Oh, thank you. We've got food for your thoughts. Oh, wow. So our specials board is down here. Okay. Um, if you're looking for an appetizer and maybe a, a main course, I might suggest the uh, survey soup and the um, artifact analysis Alfredo. Mm. The inquiries enchiladas are excellent as well. And then we've got a Chaco Taco for dessert. Does the inquiries enchilada sound good, but I think I'm going to go with that simulated survey soup today. Okay, we're doing simulated survey soup. Yes, sir. And would you like a main course as well? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's, uh, let's go for the Alfredo. Yeah. All right, sounds artifact good analysis Alfredo. All right, excellent. Let me get you rung up here. All right. All right, so we've got the soup. Alfredo, and then we've got the generosity of our donors taking it down to zero dollars and zero cents. That's the best price there is. All right, well, somebody will have your soup out back. Feel free to head over there whenever you're ready. Thank you, sir. Yep. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our mobile learning lab. Thank you. 
One of the things that the Mobile Learning Lab wants to do is bring archaeology to those who want to learn about archaeology. Obviously, not everybody can come to Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, so we go to them. This is an example of what we want to help participants and students understand that archaeology consists of a lot of things. Learning, understanding about the humans that lived in the region, and then also experiencing physically learning with hands-on opportunities. This is one example of that. We help them understand what archaeology is, the ethics and the knowledge that are, is acquired of obtaining items, and then interpret it so we know and understand about the human beings who have lived here. As we walk around, we're going to be seeing sort of a simulating environment of what we call an archaeological site. We might have some structures that were built a long ago, and then we bring that to the environment and students so they can learn a little bit about that. Archaeology is really acquiring knowledge. It's not about finding things, but it's finding out about things. That's what archaeology is, and so the Mobile Learning Lab is a way that we can take this environment to where we would go. That's why we call it the Mobile Learning Lab. Excellent. Thank you. I'm excited to learn more. Good afternoon, sir. Oh, hello again. Well, I finished up my modules. Well, I hope you enjoyed your appetizer. Uh, this is one of our main courses uh, that you ordered, the Artifact Analysis Alfredo. So we've got a couple of microscopes that um, students can actually take out onto the field as well. So they come un unattached from those bases um, so they can go out and look at plants and artifacts in the field as well. Um, all of the artifacts, of course, are uh, replica artifacts, but we do have you know tools like calipers and um, scales and microscopes that you would use in the, in the lab, as well as our artifact analysis sheet um, that has kind of been simplified for students to use, um, just so they can get a taste of, of what uh, lab work is like. This is amazing. Well, I have to hit the road for New Mexico, so uh, I think I was promised something. Oh yeah, that's right, you're going to New Mexico. Yeah. Take yourself a Chaco Taco. Oh, thank you, sir. You're I appreciate welcome. it. You have a good day. You too. Cheers. Bye. Hi, I'm Jonas. Hi, I'm Jeremy. Guanti. Hi, I'm John. Yeah, I'm Alicia. We're the education team, and this is our skit. <laughs> oh, I think that artifact Alfredo analysis really got to me. Thank you to our educators for that wonderful skit, and to everyone who funded our uh, uh, mobile learning food truck serving up food for thought. <laughs> Next up is our research institute. Uh, at the annual meeting last year, Ricky gave an incredible tri tribute to Mark Varian, uh, our executive vice president of the research institute that you can still watch on YouTube on our channel. Uh, following Mark's retirement, the Research Institute is now led by Executive Vice President Dr. Susan Ryan, and she and the Institute staff have been busy this year developing the next generation of research questions and projects. Uh, for their update, uh, Dr. Ryan chose to showcase two members of the Research Institute and their projects, Dr. Jonathan Dombrowski and Grant Coffey. So here is what they have to share with you. Hi folks, I'm Jonathan Dombrowski and I'm a postdoctoral scholar here at Crow Canyon in the Research Institute. Um, and I wanted to take a couple of minutes today to show you one of the really cool things we've been working on. Um, what we've been working on is um, automatic reporting with our research database. So what we can actually do is instantaneously connect to our research database and run it through a series of analyses that we then can use in our meetings and to answer future questions and things like that. So what I'm gonna do is actually I'm gonna share my screen, kind of walk you through um, this, this one report, a pottery report. So here is, we're using the R programming language to do that. Um, and so you don't really have to know much about R programming, but basically what all this does, this hard code does, it connects us through to um, our, our internal server that has our data in it. Every single time we run this, it connects it, imports all of the fresh new data that we've 
helps you know say we've input over the few the, a few weeks or months or something like that so we input all of the data new and then we run it through a series of analyses that we've all worked on together um, and we can kind of see all these different graphs and what we call analytics and so what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to run this right now for you and we're going to fast forward through it so you don't have to sit here the entire time it takes about a minute or two to go through it I'm going to render this report right now. All right. So what you can see here is an actual HTML file that renders out, say you can open it in, you know, Google Chrome or uh, whatever internet kind of explorer app that you use um, so this html file renders out we've got our the crow canyon insignia kind of baked into it um, we've got um, the, a timestamp baked into it as well so you know everyone can kind of keep track of all these different files that they have and know which one is the latest um, and we've also got um, a table of contents that you can go through and click through here. But for instance, this gives us away some of the analyses that we're interested in for, say, this pottery report, or how up to up to the minute are we with um, analyzing bags that are in the lab. So right here we can see kind of a progress bar. So all of the bags from the Haney site were actually 98.18% caught up with in the lab. Um, and by, by weight, we're also 96.68% analyzed. Uh, in the lab. Another thing, for instance, that we can do, uh, which is really super great, is um, we can just see a, a nice figure here that shows us all the different pottery types, the abundance of all the different pottery types that we have at the site we're working on. Um, some of the other really cool things that we can do is we can run really robust models to look at um, the occupation date ranges from the site based off of uh, pottery types. Um, so here, based off of the, all the data that we have now, which is not complete yet, uh, you can see that our time span for the Haney site just based off of pottery is 8800 to 1175. But we can also do really cool things like run that model for every single study unit we have. So we can iterate this across really complex data, data frames. Um, what other things that we can look at, uh, this is a crazy graph, I won't go into it, but different kind of form types, the count of each, the part of the pot, all these different things um, that we'd like to know about. Um, and then what we can do is talk about these and then see how they might be answering some of the research questions that we have. And then we, during meetings, can devise new ways to test some of the ideas that we have. Um, and so what's also really cool is that, so like I said, you can open this file kind of anywhere. You can open it on your computer or on your phone, um, and it can help us um, maybe give tours or things like that as well. Um, so this is just one of the cool things the Research Institute is working on, and we really appreciate all of your support. Hi everybody, my name is Grant Coffey and I'm the Research Database Manager here at Crow Canyon. Uh, I also work in the Research Institute. Um, one of the big projects that we've been talking about lately has to do with LIDAR, light detection and ranging. There's a, a new data set that's become available from the USGS that allows users to download and use um, really high resolution one meter digital data that was collected by fixed wing LIDAR. So airplane flying over, shooting a laser down, measuring the bounce back and using all that information to render topography in a really accurate and very detailed way. So I'm just going to share my screen and we can get going. So hopefully you can see this now. Um, <clears throat> this area here is the process LIDAR that we have for southwestern Colorado and southeastern Utah. It's essentially the entire, what we refer to as the Central Mesa Verde region. And this is a hillshade or just a rendering of the digital elevation data with the sun at a certain altitude and um, orientation to the landscape. Um, <clears throat> really quickly, if we put on the, the sites from the Village Ecodynamics Project, all of these white dots, and you can see they fall out in southwestern Colorado. All of the blue dots are sites that are recorded as community centers. So these would be sites that have about 50 rooms or more uh, surface rooms, about nine or more pit structures, or public architecture, like a great Kiva. Um, 
So you can see there's a lot of these really big sites in southwestern Colorado, and there's even more in southeastern Utah um, that we refer to as community centers. One goal of uh, processing and analyzing all of this new LiDAR imagery is to assess our current records for these really large sites and see if the LiDAR data illustrates anything new uh, about the, the community centers themselves. So what I'm gonna do is just zoom into a, a specific area and we'll look at a, a portion of the landscape. So this, this area here is actually Goodman Point Unit of Hope and Weep National Monument. Let me go ahead and shut off all of these sites where we can zoom in just a little bit. Some folks are probably familiar with this area. We, we ran a project there from about 2005 to 2011. Um, one thing that I think the LiDAR data shows really well for this particular area is Goodman Point Pueblo itself, which is located about in here, and then all of the other um, individual habitations that are located within the Goodman Point unit. This is Goodman Point Pueblo here. Um, this is a Harlan Great Kiva site. This is the Belt Loop Road. Um, you can really see how a lot of this stuff shows up really well on the LiDAR data. Um, a number of these things we had already mapped as part of our work out at Goodman Point, uh, Goodman Point Pueblo, all of these smaller habitation sites up in here. Um, we also had this section of a road called the Goodman Point Belt Loop Road mapped as part of our field work. But one thing we didn't ever recognize or map was this other roadway that's also kind of a belt loop that comes right through here and connects to Goodman Point Pueblo. So this kind of illustrates the type of record update we'd like to do for places like Goodman Point using this LiDAR or we can use the visualization to reassess things like feature counts, room counts, uh, pit structure counts, uh, the presence or absence of public architecture, and specifically things like additional roadways or trails that can be very hard to detect on the landscape when you're just standing out there, but really show up well on the, on the process LiDAR imagery. Um, so that's that's one thing that we hope to do. Um, zooming back out, there will probably be about 180 sites that we'll want to reassess um, <clears throat> for things that show up on LiDAR that aren't part of the record. And this will include some sites in southeastern Utah as well, the Headley site, the Carhartt site, and some others. Um, so it's a pretty ambitious undertaking. We're just really in the planning stages, but I think this new information will really allow us to look at some of these big uh, community center sites in a whole new way and probably open up entirely new uh, research pathways that, that weren't available before. So it's pretty exciting and uh, I'll keep you updated. Thanks a bunch. Bye. All right. Uh, we'll move from that digital world of computational archaeology uh, to the place where the data uh, Jonathan is tracking originated, uh, the Haney site, led by field archaeologist Dave Satterwhite and Steve Copeland. Here they go. Good morning. I'm Dave Sutterwhite, and I'm the new field manager for the archaeology department. Uh, we'd like to go over a few things that we've been working on this season, give you a few highlights. Um, and thank you for your support for all our projects out here this year. Uh, first off, this year we've been concentrating over on the west part of the site, on the earlier component. Uh, we're beginning our wrap up of the earlier component, excavated to finish in the east trench, which is a major portion of the earlier component. So, series of pit structures that we we're excited about getting dates on and seeing how that fits into the whole placement of this part of the village. Um, one exciting thing that we've had recently, really recently, is the structure over here by on this side of the site. We've had our pollen specialist just discovered a cotton pollen, which is very rare in this area, and as far as I uh, know and the history of Crow Canyon, we haven't had one in this context, in this good context. So that's exciting. We've had 10 college field school students out here teaching future professionals how to excavate ethically and professionally. We've had four interns. One thing I'm excited about the interns this year is 
of seeing a lot of diversity, more diversity in the applicants and the selectees. And, 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 uh, I did know what Dave says. I'd like to just say hello to everybody on the board. Thank you for your support. Uh, we're doing well out here. The research is coming along nicely. Like Dave said, the big picture for us is this only component uh, out here on the site. Let me wrap that up. It's pretty, pretty important for this area. Uh, these two big parks that we have here. We haven't seen that in any other site because I think we spoke about that. And our interns. We should probably introduce you to them. Good morning. My name is Summer. Um, I am the Crow Canyon Session 2 field intern and very, very excited to be here. I'm coming from Florida. I graduated from Flagler College in St. Augustine, Florida with a degree in anthropology and cultural environmental science. Learning lots. We are defining a feature right now. So this is feature one and there's potential that it was a mortar mixing pit. So you can kind of see the edges here and I'm getting it down to sterile at the moment. Um, but real nice and red, beautiful colors and learning lots while I'm in here. Hello, uh, my name is Taryn Fixco. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, but I came here from Colorado. <laughs> I graduated from the Colorado College in 2021 with a Bachelor's in Anthropology. This is my first time doing excavation work, um, so it was really exciting to be here. Um, right here, what I'm working on is a potential pit, maybe an atrium, who knows? Um, Finding a lot of cool stuff. Um, this redware right here. Um, can't identify it for you right now, but <laughs> I will at the end of this video. <laughs> uh, finally, the archaeology department would like to thank the board for their past and present support and their continued support in the future as the archaeology department contributes to the core mission of Crow Canyon going forward. Thank you to our field staff and interns. A logical move into our next update is from the field staff to the lab staff, where we are excited to welcome our new lab manager, who you will meet on this video, Ruben Sinensky. Many people who make their careers uh, at Crow Canyon were once interns, including myself. And after his internship, Ruben went on to earn his PhD, and we are so happy to welcome him back. Uh, for their update to you, Ruben and lab staff, Jamie Merriweather and Kate Hughes, uh, decided to get out of the lab on a beautiful day and talk to you from one of our outdoor classrooms. Here they are. Hello, my name is Reuven. I am the new lab manager uh, here at Crow Canyon. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Wonderful organization. Um, work with all the great folks here. Um, my incredible team, uh, Jamie and Kate. Uh, and uh, I have uh, some history here with Crow Canyon. I was uh, one of Karen Adams' former interns in 2011. Um, and my focus in archaeology is primarily uh, paleoethnobotany. So I study plant remains from archaeological sites. And at, you know, at Crow Canyon, there's a really rich history of um, training a young generation of uh, paleoethnobotanists that have gone on to work all over the Southwest and beyond. And we're really excited to get that program going again. And um, train interns to make sure uh, we can continue doing that kind of research um, in the northern southwest. Um, we have all kinds of flotation samples we've collected from the Haney site. I'm really excited to start um, analyzing those um, and identifying all the different types of plants that people, uh, ancestral Pueblo people were using for food, um, for fuel, for medicine um, in the ancient past. Um, and we've got a really great and unique laboratory program here at Crow Canyon um, that, you know, has always, for the past 40 years, um, leaned heavily on um, volunteers, on interns. Um, it's not just staff that makes uh, this work, makes the research we do, the education we do possible. Um, it's 
you know, uh, a cast of millions, as they say. And um, Jamie and Kate are gonna um, introduce some of the work that we've been doing um, over the past year in the lab. Hi, I'm Jamie. I worked in the lab. I worked here for a long time. Um, it's great to have a new boss. <laughs> Change our focus a little bit. It'll be fun to get back in the new body. But so our lab staff is Reuben and Kate Hughes and myself, and we have Susan Montgomery who comes in part time, works for us, and we do. We've been doing a lot of processing of float samples and cataloging basic analysis. We're starting some new projects, um, but we're just at the very beginning, so we won't talk about the time this time. Um, we have a nice batch of volunteers, and like Ruben said, we're all involved in this, this uh, laboratory processing. Um, we have volunteers like uh, Rob Lyle, who looks at temper for pottery. She does a great job for us. And we have some pottery analysts who come in periodically. We haven't used them a lot this year. Uh, but Barbara, Barbara Stagg, Diane um, McBride, and uh, Gail Ladage, and jo Joe Lentz. And they've done some pottery analysis for us. We haven't continued that program a lot this year because we've gotten caught up. Um, we also have uh, Bill Aldendorfer, who has done some nice rehousing of the pottery that we borrowed from the Canyons of the Ancients in our curation room. Beautiful display in there now. Nancy Evans been working in their library. We've reorganized the library and she's doing inventory and checking books and making sure that they're all there. So we had a lot of interns this year. We had um, the whole organization had seven um, interns for our first session. And then our second session, we've had three. Um, so right now we have one lab intern, Will. He's out in the field with ARP ears right now, um, bringing the lab to the field. Uh, we're getting him all trained up. He's doing a great job. Um, he's a wonderful intern. And our last session interns we had in the lab, we had um, two lab interns. Um, they were great. They learned all the analyses. They helped at the college field school. Um, they presented at the PECOS conference. Um, we also had uh, a dendro intern and a zoarch intern in the lab. So. Um, they did a lot of work for us. The dendro intern did, I think he analyzed most of the, the dendros we have right yes. now. And Anna, the Zoark intern, she did a lot of uh, final analysis under John's um, supervision and training. And uh, it's been great having all of these people in the lab. We also had some seasonals, um, Daniel Hampson and Jessica Weinmeister. And they analyzed over 5,000 pieces of debitage, chipstone debitage, and 175 five faces in just about a month, I think it was. And they did just a great job. And then also we have chipstone volunteers that um, I love to talk about because they're great. <laughs> they analyzed about 5,000 pieces in the last year. Um, we have, um, in our chipstone group, we have Dave Melanson, Larry Keller, and Lou Mattis, and they're just great volunteers. Um, and I think that was about it. <laughs> Something, you know, we were talking about earlier yeah. was um, well, just, and I feel like here at Crow Canyon, we can forget um, how unique it is to have volunteers coming in and analyzing flake stone debitage. That's the byproduct of tool making. And it's, we were talking about it. I, none of us are familiar with another research organization where this type of thing happens. Usually that is a specialist job. Yeah. Um, and the specialist um, is the person that does that type of work. Here at Crow Canyon, there is such a long history of volunteers doing this type of incredibly important research that underlies you know, everything we do, the inferences we draw about what ancestral Pueblo people were doing in the past. It's volunteers are such a core part of that process. It's it's a really unique thing um, here at Crow Canyon, and there's such a long history of it. It's it, I'm it's one of the reasons I'm really excited to be here. Um, and one more thing we wanted to mention is just the really great research that. Um, our staff and interns have been presenting at conferences. Kate presented um, her research um, 
at the Pecos conference just a few weeks ago. Um, what was that research all about? It was about drills and drill holes from the heating site assemblage. It's pretty neat. Um, <laughs> really important work and the interns also um, presented their research at the Pecos conference. Such an incredible opportunity to really, you know, for the first time, put the work that you have done out there um, and get feedback. Um, I remember when the first time I did that and it sort of you know, set a, a trajectory for me in archaeology. Um, something I'm working on right now, um, just yesterday was the deadline for presenting, um, uh, at the submitting for presentations at the Society for American Archaeology meeting that's upcoming. Um, they will also be presenting there. I am organizing a session to honor my mentor, uh, Karen Adams, um, and the incredible work um, that she has done over the past um, 30 plus years. For thank the you, lab. board members. Thank yeah, you board and support. <laughs> we appreciate yes. it. Thank you, board members, for your support. You know, yes. None of this would be possible without you. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And I look forward um, to meeting all of the board members that I have not had a chance um, to meet yet. Thank you, Reuben and Kate and Jamie for that wonderful chat and update. And I just have to give a real time live shout out. Thank you to Joe Lynn uh, in our chat who's watching today who just bought 16 books for the American Indian Initiatives Library. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm getting, getting texts from Becky and Rebecca uh, about how excited they are about that. We are just so blessed with everyone's generosity. Uh, speaking of interns, uh, as, as our lab staff were talking about, we wanted to show you the work of these interns and what they were up to this summer. And if history is any guide, these are the future leaders of Crow Canyon.
Thank you, interns. Our, uh, our intern program is really one of the crown jewels of Pro Canyon. And if you, in addition to working here, uh, so many of our hundreds of interns uh, at Crow Canyon over the years have gone on to really exceptional professional careers. We have a webinar on our YouTube channel uh, that we that we did with a number of our former interns who are uh, professional archaeologists and even in other fields. So if you want to check that out, you can see some examples of what happens when you're an intern at Crow Canyon. Our final mission update, uh, our final video is an update on the 2023 College Field School, which is another one of our most successful programs that was developed by Dr. Susan Ryan, who receives grants from the National Science Foundation to support this important work, uh, training the archaeologists of the future. Um, so I will not steal Susan's thunder and let her tell you all about her program. Hello everyone, my name is Susan Ryan and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Research Institute. It is my honor to discuss one of Crow Canyon's most important and impactful programs, the National Science Foundation Research Experiences for Undergraduates CITES program. This program, also known as the Crow Canyon College Field School, supports authentic archaeological research experiences for 10 undergraduate students from underrepresented populations over the course of seven weeks. Students were a mix of sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and were from various states, colleges, and universities from across the nation. On the Crow Canyon campus, students actively engaged in scientific research alongside professional mentors within the framework of two of our long-term research projects, the Northern Chaco Outliers Project and the Hawkins Preserve Survey Project. Initiated in 2017, the Northern Chaco Outliers Project addresses important research questions surrounding the expansion of Chaco-style communities in the Mesa Verde region, as well as broader anthropological research questions concerning human-environment interactions, the development of inequality and equality, the political role of community centers, and identity formation and disillusion. College field school students also conducted pedestrian survey at the Hawkins Preserve, a 122-acre area located just south of Cortez, Colorado. The preserve includes numerous ancestral habitations that are part of the Mitchell Springs community, one of the largest community centers in the Mesa Verde region. They documented several historic sites associated with Ute and Diné occupations, as well as the earliest Euro-American settlers in the area. Unique to this program, field school students work with Crow Canyon's native scholars and residents who reside on campus for a week at a time with the purpose of providing cultural knowledge, perspectives, and insights. This program facilitates a more holistic understanding of modern and past indigenous cultures, promotes trust relations, and provides indigenous perspectives and interpretations in the disciplines of archaeology, anthropology, education, and American Indian studies. This summer, we welcomed Moana Loma Omvaya from the Hopi village of Haute Villa. Moana is a research specialist in the Archaeological Records Office at the Arizona State Museum and is a subject matter expert on the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act and related repatriation policy and applications. We also welcomed Dr. Justin Lund from the Navajo Nation. Justin is a postdoctoral scholar at Northern Arizona University, where he works towards building community relationships, bridging scientific and indigenous knowledges, and teaches students ethical research practices in genomics. College field school students engaged in a service learning project in collaboration with the Bushwhackers, a summer program for youth on the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation in Toyok, Colorado. Field school students taught the bushwhackers fire starting with a bow drill, how to make cordage, how to throw an atlatl, and played the hoop and stick game. Each August, archaeologists and students gather for the Pecos Conference to discuss recent research in the southwestern United States and northern Mexico. 
This conference remains an important opportunity for students to meet with professional archaeologists to learn about the profession, gain access to resources, create social networks, and to learn about research opportunities, methods, and theories related to archaeology. It's also an important venue for students to present original research in a professional setting. This year, the field school students worked in groups to prepare three unique research posters in collaboration with Crow Canyon mentors. In sum, students receive extensive preparation in STEM-based learning objectives that are necessary for future success within the discipline. This program provides students with the knowledge, skills, and abilities to secure employment within archaeology and to pursue advanced degrees, emerging as the next generation of professionals, tribal historic preservation officers, cultural preservation officers, educators, and leaders within the sciences. Inferences generated about past human behaviors are utilized to create a better understanding of the principles that govern culture change worldwide and to address issues relevant to today's societies, providing critical information to guide future policy making. Thank you for joining us today and for supporting our mission and impactful professional training programs like the Crow Canyon College Field School. Thank you, Susan. I hope that everyone enjoyed that presentation. Our college students are truly exceptional and many of them come back as interns uh, and uh, move on with their professional career. So we're so lucky to have so many generations uh, working for us. The next uh, item up on the agenda are uh, mission updates. So let me just raise my, uh, my PowerPoint one more time here. Uh, okay. Uh, oops, sorry. One more slide. The next is organizational updates. There we go. The first update I would like to share with you is about Kirk Canyon's Board of Trustees. Uh, you have heard uh, in the videos our staff uh, thanking our trustees and talking about them and uh, they are, it goes without saying, absolutely critical uh, to our success. They are passionate about the mission of Crow Canyon, and they are all much beloved by all of our staff. Uh, in addition to all of this uh, and the support and investments that, that our board make in us, they are also subject matter experts that provide invaluable perspective and governance to Crow Canyon. We have archeologists, community leaders, tribal historic preservation officers, attorneys, business leaders, engineers, much more people from many walks of life, uh, many communities, uh, many different types of life experience. And there are a few changes that I am very excited, hot off the press, uh, to share with you. Uh, as we talked about at the beginning of the meeting, uh, Ricky Lightfoot is stepping down as chair, but remaining in some very important roles on the board. So these are the newly, as in just yesterday, elected officers, board officers of Crow Canyon. Uh, Leslie Masson uh, is taking over for Ricky as chair. Uh, Leslie uh, has homes here in Indian Camp Ranch at Crow Canyon and also lives in Lexington, uh, Massachusetts, but travels to Crow Canyon a great deal and is incredibly passionate about the Southwest. Uh, Carl Kumli is taking over for Leslie, who was the vice chair, uh, as the vice chair, uh, as the vice chair of Crow Canyon. Uh, Carl is working as uh, a water attorney, uh, represents many tribes in the Southwest, uh, and lives in Denver, and is a long, long-time supporter of Crow Canyon. And Pam Powell was re-elected. She has been our secretary for many years, uh, also a retired professional uh, living in Denver, and does an enormous amount of work to keep us on track at Crow Canyon. Thank you, Pam and Carl and Leslie. We are really excited about working with you. Uh, we did not elect any new trustees during the pandemic. Uh, as you can imagine, with the shutdown of the campus, it was a very difficult time, we thought, to integrate new folks into the Board of Trustees and uh, get them acquainted with the organization when all of us were working from home. 
uh, and, and working on our mission digitally. But uh, we have made up for that in 2023. We have five new trustees that we have elected to the board. Uh, if you visit our website at www.crowcanyon.org, there are full bios for all of our trustees. But we have Teresa Pasquale, who is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Pueblo of Acoma, among much other work that she does in uh, around the Southwest. Uh, Jim Potter, who is uh, an archaeologist uh, with um, Chronicle Heritage. Chris Toya, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer uh, at the Pueblo of Jemez. Um, uh, Delia Children, who is a retired attorney uh, living in Arizona, and Sandra Flo, a recently retired uh, attorney from New York. All of, all of our folks, all of this class uh, is incredibly familiar uh, with, with Crow Canyon. Um, Teresa and Chris have been on our Native American advisory group uh, for a very long time. Uh, Jim was actually a seasonal researcher here at Crow Canyon in the 90s when I was an intern. Uh, and Delia and Sandra have worked with us, traveled with us, uh, uh, been participants on our programs for many years. We are so grateful to have them join the board and be working with us on our future. So as we do every year, uh, we update you on our prior year financial status at the annual meeting, the prior year being two, 2022. Last year, when we updated you on 2021, one of the big questions that we talked about was how will we replace the PPP funding that, that we and many other organizations uh, received to help out during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, Ricky did the financial report last year and talked extensively about what we were planning with respect to fundraising uh, to be able to um, uh, move forward from any dependence uh, on the PPP from the prior years. So it was really you, uh, our donors, our very small but mighty advancement staff, and all of our employees at Crow Canyon that have very long relationships uh, and friendships with our loyal donors. We really cannot do it without you. Uh, our balance sheet here on the left shows our assets remain strong, the majority of which are contained within our endowment, which is listed under investments uh, and pledges. Uh, our endowment is restricted, but it provides uh, cash distributions every year to help fund our activities. It does not fund all of our activities. Uh, our endowment would have to be uh, five times this size to really fund our annual budget. So we, of course, uh, rely on other sources of funding which you can see over on the right side. Uh, annual contributions uh, from our donors, some tuition uh, from our programs offsets the cost of our programs, but does not cover the cost of our programs. We also rely on, on scholarships and other donor funding and appeals to be able to cover those costs. Uh, and grants from proposals that are written by all of our staff to fund their projects. Our endowment portfolio is invested according to the rules that govern nonprofits and as other people may have experienced, 2022 was not a great year for the stock market. Thus, our investment income uh, experienced a pretty significant unrealized loss in 2022, uh, which decreased our net assets. The, it is an unrealized loss, uh, however, and our investments are still invested and the market is recovering. So, And we are adding some bequests to our assets every year. So we hope to have some uh, gains to report to you next year. And since 2022 was a while back and we are about to enter the fourth quarter of 2023, uh, I'd like to give you an update on our position that we just gave the board yesterday and had discussion. Uh, year to date, as of the end of August, uh, we're showing an increase of assets just shy of, of 2 million from last year that we just showed you. Uh, and some other metrics we are proud of. Uh, we have a line of credit if we need it, but we are not using it. We have no external debt uh, and we have reserves in our invested accounts, which come, uh, uh, mo most of it comes from long anticipated uh, bequests from our donors and major donors who have invested in our long-term financial success. It is our vision that these accounts will be funding the distributions that we need every year in five years, in 10 years and beyond. Uh, we create these to give us long-term stability, uh, but we can't operate uh, in the near term uh, without your help uh, and, and your help today. One of our uh, longest serving board members, uh, Sue Anschutz Rogers, who runs the Anschutz Family Foundation in Denver, uh, reminds me every trustee meeting uh, that cash is king. Uh, and we agree, Carla and I agree. 
Uh, one of our goals since the financial turnaround of 2019 is to maintain positive unleveraged cash flow so that at the start of every year, we are in a solid position. We don't need to borrow any money uh, to be engaging in our uh, in our in our regular annual activities. So we anticipate still having uh, $2 million in cash at the end of the year to be able to kick off all of the work that we are going to be doing in 2024. The real bottom line here uh, is that most of our funding every year comes from donors. We can't do it without your support. And we take our responsibility to steward the funds that you and everyone who came before you uh, gave us very seriously. Uh, in addition to our annual fundraising, bequests over the last 40 years have built our endowment and continue to help us build our reserves and long-term funds. Uh, the fact that we take this long view and maintain an operation with no debt and strong cash flow does not mean that we don't need your contributions. That's the uh, uh, the risk of uh, of sharing our our stable financial situation. We don't want you to think that uh, that we don't need contributions uh, because we do. The strong position that we have built depends on new donations every year, and as we all know, the costs of everything go up every year. The reason that we manage our funds prudently and with safety nets uh, is that without the assurances that we are a forever organization and we are a well-run organization, we could not attract the talented staff that we need to deliver on our mission and assure them that they can build their careers here for the long term. Uh, we would not be able to attract the donors who want to ensure that their gifts are going to an organization that can continue to deliver long into the futures. What uh, we're showing in the bubbles on the slide, which we talked about in our board meeting yesterday as well, is the way that we have just exploded the number of ways that we deliver uh, on our core mission areas and the way that we combine them with each other. The pandemic forced us to become innovative with digital and distance mission delivery. And the result is really what Ricky describes uh, at the beginning of this meeting, fulfilling our long sought vision to expand the sphere of our mission geographically and intellectually and to show how archaeology can contribute to a healthier society. Thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, we have been able to achieve this in so many ways uh, on behalf of our staff and our board. Uh, you have our sincerest gratitude. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And we would like to uh, answer uh, any questions uh, that you might have. I will check out the chat. Uh, <laughs> we don't seem to have questions piling up in the Q&A, uh, but uh, the chat is wonderful. Thank you to everyone who has donated to uh, Becky and Re Rebecca's American Indian Initiatives Library. Um, it's it's a really it's it's an important initiative and it's a it's a dream of of Becky's and as we have uh, interns and students it's a big deal for them to be able to come in and uh, and and look at these books and check them out so all right well thank you thank you to everyone I see all of our board members have have been attending many of our donors and our staff uh, and our partners. We're just so grateful for all of you. So uh, please, uh, we will see some of you at the 40th anniversary conference uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, and we will uh, also uh, be seeing you on our program. So you'll be hearing more about our 2024 programs uh, soon. Uh, we will be rolling those out and we hope that you will all join us. And please keep joining us on our Thursday webinar series, 4 p.m. every Thursday. Uh, we have some amazing speakers uh, coming up, uh, especially in November, which is Native American Heritage Month. So I hope all of you have a wonderful rest of your Saturday, and we will see you soon.